Hello and welcome guys to another live show here on Total Space. Coming up on today's show, we're talking Astrophilia. Astro Scale is resuming testing after a glitch. SpaceX Deep Dive with Miko and lots more space news. Joining me on today's show is... Oh, I'm Rich LB, host of Becoming Multiplanetary. Nice to see everybody here. And also, we have... Hello, I'm Miko, the host of Deep Dive. Let's get this show started. So first up, we'll just run through uh, this week's launch updates. Just two uh, this week, um, a bit of a quiet one. We've got Northrop Grumman with the Antares rockets, uh, CRS and NG-17, which is a cargo mission to the International Space Station. A very quick rocket, this one, so don't miss it. Uh, Saturday, February the 19th, that one, so at uh, 5.40 p.m. UTC here in the UK, and that one's going out of uh, the Wallops flight facility. Absolutely uh mental rocket to watch that one to launch really really quick launch uh, probably one of the top three quick quickest launches i believe and then secondly what spacex falcon now another block of starlink satellites hopefully these ones will survive no magnetic uh, solar storms or anything like that that'll wipe them out hopefully this time fingers crossed fingers crossed and then uh, for that boost there'll be a drone landing ship on a short fall of gravitas and that will be launching on sunday the 20th at 413 utc and that one's going out of uh, cape canaveral on the launch pad 40. so that's launch updates out the way first up um astro rocket suffered a catastrophic failure um earlier last week uh, it was supposed to build to be their first florida launch with four satellites lost unfortunately um but uh, things didn't go quite to plan, uh, or as smoothly as planned. Uh, the two-stage Astro rocket performed well off the launch pad, as some of you guys might have seen, for the first two minutes. Uh, but something appeared to go wrong after about the three minutes into the flight, just after the rocket's first and second stage separated. We saw the two stages clumped together, and then uh, later on, uh, it wasn't on the Astro stream with NASA space flight, but uh, it was later revealed by the company that... I don't know if you've seen it on Twitter and elsewhere, the second stage essentially, as soon as it separated, the second stage just span out of control, literally flipping flipping around. So it's probably still up there or back in the atmosphere now, burnt up, uh, just cartwheeling away. But uh, did you guys catch that launch? Miko, did Miko you did catch you it? Because catch unfortunately, it. unfortunately yeah. I didn't. However, I did catch the footage of what happened when it was in uh, just as it got into orbit. I did see I what did happened see. there because I caught that on Twitter as it went by. Yeah. Um, so really yeah, the launch. That. Yeah, I was watching it live, and it was it was a huge disappointment when when Astra failed again. I mean, I was really rooting for them, and it seemed like the problem was with the fairing not deploying, so the second stage collided yeah. into the fairing we looked at we almost yeah. looked as though the second stage decoupled before the first stage had finished or re reached apogee if you like at that floating stage where they can safely move apart kind of thing it looked as though it de decoupled clunked together so then the first stage almost like nudged the second stage and when that fired up it just span it out of control because it was lighting mm. it lighting at a bit of an angle and it got a nudge off the first yeah. stage but that's my guess anyway we'll find out from astra in due course but uh unfortunate they've done the power slide they've done the spin whatever what's next the time warp who knows <laughs> but uh well, hopefully hopefully a nice smooth sailing launch third time yeah yeah fingers but, crossed yeah, but a bit unfortunate for those NASA satellites, um, first commercial launch and everything for those guys, but really hope the next one's a, a good one for them. Um, another company, uh, we spoke to Astroscale in a recent uh, interview last year, but uh, Astroscale are preparing to restart their debris removal demo, or their LCD in orbit. Uh, they've done some successful tests, but moving on to a more advanced test, they encountered one or two problems, uh, but they're preparing to resume an attempt to capture the satellite acting as a piece of debris in low Earth orbit after pausing a demonstration three weeks ago to troubleshoot the undisclosed problems. Uh, the Japanese startup has started moving the 175 kilogram space of spacecraft closer to the 17 kilogram client satellite ahead of a 
deciding whether to restart our demonstrations. Uh, Astro said, said in a recent post, um, according to Astro Scale, it has made good progress in working through solutions to the an anomaly uh, and the event identified with LCD. So it looks like they've got everything back under control and pushing ahead with testing. And this is going to be absolutely fantastic news with bringing all those space, that space about debris back down to earth. Um, but uh, we had an interview with those guys. Uh, fantastic news. Um, what do you guys make of all that? Well, I remember clearly the interview we had with uh, Harriet Brettel, yeah. and it was a rather interesting interview indeed. And I believe that was actually before they had launched the Elsa D. Am I correct in saying that? Um, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was just before they launched the LCD. Mm -hmm. So going into the LCD project, I was looking forward to see, because obviously we saw the, the various demonstrations that they'd execute where they would have the straight throw and catch, mm -hmm. and then they could progress to more complex catches, including putting the dummy object into a free tumble and then trying to match the orbit to the mag plate and then go in for the retrieval. Yeah, I so, think it was, it, it was the more advanced testing where they had to set it into a free spin, as you said, the second mm -hmm. more advanced test. I believe that's the one it might have uh, glitched glitched on a little bit or failed to start, um, mm -hmm. which is essentially they send the dummy satellite, if you like, or dummy debris yep. into a spin, but also a bit of a cartwheel. So they've got to match match the the, X, the rotation and, as X, well Z as axes. the orbit. Yeah. Yeah, so literally mm -hmm. with all the thrusters trying to match it, spinning around and going backwards and forwards and everything, and that a yeah. hell of a lot more complex than just going straight forward and back kind of thing. So fingers yeah. crossed for that one because I can't, even, I couldn't even imagine how to even make a satellite do that, let alone build one. So <laughs> yeah, you've got to worry <laughs> about those it's, guys. Yeah, you you know you've got to worry about its roll pitch annual. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah, and and then in space, obviously. It's, you know, you've got to orient yourself as well, uh, which is a challenge at the best of times. <laughs> yeah, but uh, absolutely fantastic news that they're getting back underway. And some more fantastic news from uh, from Earth over to Mars. Perseverance is, uh, I believe, uh, one whole year on Mars today. Uh, uh, Perseverance sent a tweet out, I've been on Mars for an Earth year, and I'm learning so much on this planet. Uh, watch out for a live event on my landing anniversary and where you can ask members and team questions on our mission. Um, so I believe we're getting a live stream from NASA at some point, maybe today or tomorrow. Uh, we can ask the engineers questions and everything, but perseverance and curiosity, absolutely amazing work they're doing on Mars, drilling away and venturing around, and ingenuity, that amazing helicopter that's flown God knows how many times now. Absolutely un unbelievable uh, work being done. But one whole year, it's, it seems like yesterday that the thing launched. Well, speaking of ingenuity, I believe not that long ago it got its feet stuck uh, yeah. when it was trying to make its way back to Perseverance. Uh, what had happened was uh, when they went over this sort of large area, on the way over mm. there, they actually did the whole flight in one shot um, uh, because I'm not quite sure how. And it actually, um, I think it was a record. Yeah. for them to fly ingenuity on that one shot and then on the way back because the martian season was slightly different the atmosphere was thinner mm. so the blades had to spin harder and they had to yeah. set down before they got to the cliff edge which put them in the loose sand dunes yeah and when they set down uh to obviously recharge a little bit before doing that final stretch the sand had shifted over the top of the legs it mm. would look like and uh, eventually, when they did get it dislodged, you could see there was like four little craters in the sand where yeah. the uh, <laughs> the legs had been stuck. So, but they did manage to get it out, and they did manage to return it to nearby some tracks uh, from yeah. seven months ago, I believe. The tracks were that would that had passed by. A bit more solid ground, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, luckily, the it's an advanced helico helicopter, so it's probably got more than enough power to blow the sand away and lift itself out of trouble but uh just uh, one of those things you just like don't know what you're going to land on with that that little ingenuity helicopter because you're going into uncharted waters essentially you don't know if you're going to land on rock sand or even 
something else. <laughs> I've just <laughs> I've just noticed a, a viewer question there from Kai E. Um, they're saying, "What do you think about Mars Orbiter for laser com for real time data? When do you expect that?" Now, mm. as for the Mars Orbiter, um, what I would say on this is there's another test that is coming first that is going to prove out a step that we need before we reach the step that you've asked in your question. And that is, I'm not sure if you've heard recently of Polaris Dawn. Uh, the One of the first missions that they are going to be doing is to test the Starlink laser com uh, so that they can have a connection with Earth uh, at a high rate. Now, this laser com, the back facing laser com, needs to be established before we then start to work on doing laser coms with the Mars orbiter. Once we've proved out the, the back facing Starlink laser com, then we can start to, you know, look at trying to connect those with the Mars orbiter and see where we go from there. And make them survive a geomagnetic storm from the sun. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it seems it seems a bit of a, a glitch. I know there were those satellites that went down weren't quite in orbit, so that's partially why they got wiped out. But um, yeah, they had to go. They had to go into a safe mode to protect themselves from the storm, and yeah. then by the time they managed to get them out, they were too low in orbit to. to yeah, do they were about experience, it. experiencing. I can't remember how much more drag. I, I won't want to say the percentage. Fifty percent more drag in the atmosphere than they should have to reach mm -hmm. orbit higher up, and that's why they came back down essentially. Yeah, but uh, it just poses one of the the risks with although this is amazing technology, lasers and this, that, and the other, the sun. Can just obliterate anything, no matter how much money you've got. <laughs> yeah, let's use lasers. Bang! There's a sun. No, you haven't got lasers. <laughs> yeah, still, that's that's going to be an easy, easy problem to solve. They just yeah. fly the satellites fifty kilometers up in the orbit. Starlink train to Mars, and then laser communication sorted. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it'd be absolutely amazing technology once this get that set up. Um, we speed up communications for the obviously all the, the space stations being planned because obviously the International Space Station is getting retired within 30 years and everything. I know you wanted to say a little bit on that, Rich. I don't know if you want to expand on that. Uh, on the International Space Station being decommissioned. Ah, and... right, yeah. That is coming up later, but I believe, uh, unless I got the order wrong, I believe Miko has his segment first. Yeah, we can go with that if you want. Um... No, nope. okay. Hang on. No, it's fine. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> We've been getting... Go Gotta now. Rewind. Let's do it now. Let's do it now. Let's do it now. <laughs> okay. Um, are you oh, yeah. finished with uh, your thing here? Yeah, yeah. We're just going on okay. about lasers and the International Space Station. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Right then. Laser. So, big shout out to Stinger NSW for this topic that is coming up right now. Uh, we're going to be talking a little about a place called Point Nemo. Now, Point Nemo is at coordinates 48 degrees, 52.6 seconds uh, south and 123 degrees and 23.6 seconds west. Now, if you were to actually look at this on the map, it looks like it's somewhere out in the ocean, like completely in the middle of nowhere. Um, in fact, it is so far from land that at certain times, the closest human people to this point are the astronauts aboard the ISS. So it's it really is out in nowhere. So, yes, it's a space in the middle of the ocean, and it definitely doesn't have anything to do with a clownfish. <laughs> so, it is, in fact, named after Captain Nemo from the Jules Verne book 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Now, oceanographers claim that there's not even marine wildlife living this far out at this point, because it is so far from any landmass. And... It is, in effect, a space graveyard. Uh, at the bottom of Nem uh, Point Nemo, you will find various bits of debris from various spacecraft that we've uh, decommissioned over time. 
Notable residents include around six Salyu stations, the Mir station, and some parts of Skylab. Tian Gong Wan was supposed to have come down to rest here as well. However, unfortunately, China missed the area and uh, they came to rest just outside the designated area of Point Nemo. And also, what's really, really notable about this is that in the future, out to about the 2030s, I believe it's 2036, it will also sadly be the future grave site of the International Space Station when it reaches the end of its life. Uh, eventually, it will come down in a burning blaze of glory and end up at the bottom of Point Nemo. Uh, also, another one that should be coming to rest there when it reaches the end of the service life as well is the Hubble Space Telescope. So when that also eventually reaches the end of its service life, it will also be sunk in Point Nemo. Now, we'd have loved to have had some nice B-roll to show you here, but unfortunately, finding a lot of information about Point Nemo can be quite difficult. So... We just have a nice little chat about it today. Uh, Ryan, Miko, have you guys heard about this place prior to what I just talked about? Yeah, I've heard of Point Nemo and uh, the previous conversations with yourself and everything. I haven't read too much into it and everything, so I, I won't go into too much detail and uh, ramble on about <laughs> facts that aren't correct, because you know what I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hadn't really heard the name. I think it was actually Mr. Producer who told it first time and that was by stinger nsw suggestion but mm. i knew i basically knew that there was a point in the ocean where everything is dumped yeah i mean <laughs> yeah. uh the thing is point nemo in and of itself is officially only about 25 years old it didn't technically exist until 1992 so in in terms of you know being in the ether for people having heard about it it's understandable how some people may not have heard about it it's a uh, you know somewhere that only officially existed since 92 but uh, it certainly is it, it would be great if you know someone could get like a one of them you know those unmanned subs that you can get the remote operated ones mm. just down there take some footage I can't imagine there'd be too much uh, down there and everything because a lot majority, hopefully, it didn't make it down to the ocean as such. Nothing too much, but <laughs> hopefully nothing too toxic. A three three headed shark or anything with lasers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, Point Nemo is qu probably quite an interesting area. Um, obviously, probably quite a high target for people to retrieve and scrap metals and stuff like that of high value but it'd be interesting to see but uh would probably deem too risky to leave on orbit such as the National Space Station and the Hubble and everything to salvage it and everything but obviously we've got uh, salvaging space junk but unfortunately we haven't got the technology yet to salvage the likes of the Hubble or the International Space Station because it's just sheerly too big and as much as we'd like to be eco-friendly and save and recycle, space just isn't up to scratch yet. We're not that quite advanced, unfortunately. So we just have to bring it back down to work, down to work in that to, to Point Nemo in the middle of the ocean. Um, but it'd be interesting to see how they do the International Space Station, whether they do it in stages and stuff like that and everything, because hopefully the Pritchell module which has got all those parts on and everything from the Russian module and everything. That's uh, only just been put on there in the past few months. So whether they're going to make that last a bit longer than the rest of the space station or just get rid of the older parts or what, it'd be quite interesting to see what they do. I mean, they do have the ability to change its configuration before mm -hmm. they deorbit it. So, like, for instance, we know that Axiom 1 is going to be staying there. Yeah. Um and you know if if there's any other modules that are maybe quite new that want to stay up there maybe they could negotiate something um I mean, yeah I, to I, stay I, up there yeah i believe elon stated as well because a few people have asked him I've, I've said it here on it as well why can't starship just like a shark just uh swallow a hubble up in its belly because it c could fit in there but uh elon elon said if it was doable he'd do it but it probably won't be because it's too hypersensitive of a a satellite and securing it in space would be very very risky yeah yeah 
But yeah, uh, definitely. But yeah. Be so we <laughs> we had a, a question from civilian space in the chat earlier as well, yep. saying, "Will they send empty cargo dragons to the ISS to take home equipment from the ISS to avoid wastage?" It's a pretty good question. Whether that'll right. happen or not, I don't know. Where it will, I'm assuming that if it would, NASA would have to place the order in with SpaceX to get that sorted. Yeah, I would think pretty much everything on the International Space Station can be replaced and done cheaper on Earth. So I think there's not much to be salvaged. Yeah. And I mean, there's, uh, we already, already do that back and forth. The dragons take up uh, fuel and food and oxygen for the team up on board. And then they bring down science and experiments back down anyway. So in a way, we're already doing that. But if, if the less you take up, the more you can bring back. So it'll be all better and everything. But uh, sticking on the topic of dragon. Uh, I think we're about ready to run Miko's special segment. Uh, before that, though, shall we do outros for the evening? Yeah, sure. So, you take on, it Rich. away. Oh, me, on, me, Rich. okay. Me first. On, okay. Rich. <laughs> so... Thank you guys for sticking with us uh, through this stream so far. We've got one last segment for you guys to watch. Um, however, we would be parting ways for you here. We will be sticking around in the Discord after, though. So for those people in our community who'd like to come around and have a chat with us, feel free to do so. We'll be sticking around for a few minutes after. And what we're about to see is something that Miko has cut together. But in the meantime, I've been Rich LB. I've been Ryan from the Space Update. Go like this video, go subscribe, follow, mm -hmm. come and join us on Discord at uh, patreon.com forward slash total space. Follow us on Twitter. We're all on Twitter. But uh, thanks for watching. I'm Ryan from the Space Update. And I'm Mikko. And please enjoy the clip about SpaceX early history that I made. Uh, it's mainly based on Eric Berger's new book, Liftoff. So I read that and I, yeah, I made a short video for you and there will be another part maybe next week or another week. Yeah, enjoy the clip. Roll the tape. Hello, and welcome to another deep dive episode on the Total Space Network. Today I'm taking a look at the early SpaceX history, and most of this is from the Eric Berger book Liftoff. The story of SpaceX started when Elon Musk was thinking what's the hold up with space. Fifty years ago we had gone to the moon, and after that it has had mostly been regression. So he went to check the NASA website for any Mars projects and to his surprise he didn't find anything about people flying to Mars. So he wanted to make a change himself. His first idea was to make greenhouse on Mars. The project was called Mars Oasis. So basically the idea was to buy an old Russian ICBM or inter intercontinental ballistic missile and use that to fly a greenhouse to Mars and on Mars they would mix the Martian soil to earth soil so they could grow plants on Mars on a simulant. Elon did ask a couple of times about the ICBMs from Russia but every time he asked the price seemed to go higher. So in the end he thought it would probably be cheaper to build his own rockets. That's when he got the idea of SpaceX. And then he founded the company in 2002. After making a few hires, for example Tom Muller, who would become 
the engineer on Merlin engine. SpaceX knew they had to create an engine or develop an engine. First problem with the engine was how to make a turbo pump. SpaceX decided to buy uh, ready-made turbo pumps from another company. They didn't really work out of the box. They had quite a bit of problems. They made quite a few iterations before actually getting a turbo pump to work. And with the Merlin engine, as Tom Muller had been working in a company, developing rocket engines, at some point the previous company made a lawsuit against SpaceX because of injector design, but in the end SpaceX won the lawsuit because they had made dozens of iterations before the final version. Tom Muller thought ablative nozzles were easier to make and faster and cheaper, so SpaceX went with the ablative nozzle design. But surprise, surprise, they did change it along the way. While they were developing the engine, they had actually secured a launch site or a testing site at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California and they were building their own infrastructure for launch. They built their own launch tower, ground support equipment, everything from scratch. With pressure testing they were always running out of locks and Elon got angry and why they didn't have enough locks so in the end every time they were doing pressure tests they had a couple of extra trucks bringing in locks or liquid oxygen. Once they had the complete stage, it had a dummy second stage, then they tried to do a static fire. It wasn't as simple, but they were able to do it. And before that, Air Force had basically agreed for a SpaceX launch from Vandenberg, but no one had really believed that. So when they had a successful static fire and were ready to launch, Air Force never signed the paperwork. Elon couldn't make a lawsuit out of it as there was no denying. They just didn't sign the papers. And at the same time, there was also a billion dollar satellite waiting and a close by pad. So that didn't help. They weren't given a date for a launch. So the thing was they were running out of money. Then they had to make a decision to find another launch site. And by the way, today SpaceX actually takes preference over some other rocket companies, even with their Starlink launches. And speaking of the other launch site, SpaceX had a customer from Malaysia and their current design wasn't able to launch the satellite into orbit. So they basically had to launch very close to the equator to get the satellite into orbit. Then they remembered there's a military base quite close to the equator, which was located in the Marshall Islands and more precisely Kwajalein Atoll. So they called the army and the army was quite a bit more welcoming than the Air Force at Vandenberg. There was no launch site at the Marshall Islands, so SpaceX had to build complete second launch site infrastructure on one of the islands called Omelek Island. And people there were working crazy hours. They didn't really have any amenities there at the start. They had just a boat that took them to the island. And over the years, they got some amenities like a shower. <laughs> it was really far away from civilization. After a long time of working, SpaceX finally had the first rocket on the pad. And the preparations for launch went actually quite smoothly. And since they were, well, far away from mainland, there was no real chance of trying the pressure tests with nitrogen. So they had to use kerosene and liquid oxygen for every pressure test, but gladly all those worked out. And when they launched, 
the rocket lifted out of well, but not too long after liftoff there was a small fire under the engine and in the end the engine sat down and it fell down to the ocean. People were gathering the debris all over the island and first Elon blamed the Merlin engine team but in the end there was a few dollar nut that just couldn't take it. The nut had broken and fuel line lit on fire. After the launch one, they got some new management. Their operation turned into more more professional. They were actually starting to starting to write down every change they made to the rocket. And before the second launch, they made a list of about 15 top concerns. And there was this concern of a sloshing of second stage in some rare conditions and that was number 11 on the list. So basically they accepted the risk and went ahead with the launch. The second launch was awesome. The second launch started well with a perfect burn of the Merlin 1A engine. The engine burned right until main engine cut off and separation occurred and the second stage lit up and for a while everything was going smoothly, nominally, but at some point the second stage started started to tumble and in the end they knew there was some sloshing in the fuel tanks. So they didn't reach orbit, but as they had accepted the risk, it was pretty much a party night. They had almost accomplished an orbit. They were thinking the launch 3 would fix everything. Before launch 3, the Merlin engine team had been running into problems with the engine and their ablative nozzle. Basically they had to replace the nozzle every time they did some testing. There was crazy ideas such as Elon using epoxy to make it last longer, but that didn't help. Then they did actually go to the regenerator of the engine design and to Müller's surprise, the regenerative engine actually worked and was, was fairly easy to develop and they had much more thrust. And launch 3 happened from the Omelek island again. Everything went perfectly up to main engine cutoff and stage separation happened. But to the SpaceX team's horror, the first stage collided into the second stage. And this was due to the new regenerative engine that had such a minimal thrust they couldn't really measure it on Earth after engine shut down. But in space, that minimal thrust was enough to make the stages collide. Basically, only thing they had to do was add a few more seconds after the stage separation, so they wouldn't collide. But after the launch 3, SpaceX was running out of money. Basically, they had six weeks to launch again before running out of money. SpaceX couldn't ship the first stage on a boat because it would have taken too long. So Elon called the Air Force and somehow they were able to get on an Air Force flight that cost $500,000. The first stage was on the airplane. Everything was going smoothly until they were landing on the Quach Islands. Then the rocket started to implode. The pressure was too low since the Air Force had changed the operation parameters of the airplane. The team who had packed the stage hadn't really accounted for the faster landing. So after they saw the rocket is going to implode, they asked the pilots to get back up and fly around. Unfortunately, they had only half an hour of fuel left, so they had to act quickly. One of the people had to go inside of the rocket to open a valve so the stage could pressurize to the correct atmospheric pressure. And it was done who went inside the rocket and it was 
kind of a dangerous move if the SpaceX team hadn't been on the airplane, the military would have dropped the stage to the ocean. But they were able to open the valve and the stage stopped imploding and they were able to land. Unfortunately, the stage had been damaged, so when they got it to the island of Omelek, they called Hawthorne and made plans to get the stage back to Hawthorne and fix it there and fly it back. That didn't please Elon, so Elon said, you have one week to fix it. So the next night or day, the team on the Omelek Island completely disassembled the rocket in one day. And with such a hurry, there was of course less oversight. So that was basically more like back to the early SpaceX days. They successfully disassembled it in one day. Then they were able to fix the broken tanks. And within one week, they had assembled the rocket once again.